and welcome back. Today, this film's going to be a bit different. I unfortunately fell over and hurt my back. I'm actually immobile at present, but I really wanted to bring you this message about UFO technology, and I think it's very important. So, ow! So today I'm going to read to you what I wrote and let you make a comment. So, there's one statement by David Grush, the crashed UFO whistleblower, that should be easy to check. If its effects were possibly unclassified, good point, or spilled over into our everyday world. And that question is, what alien technology did the US crash retrieval program discover? And where is that tech today? Hmm. I constantly hear that there are two quantum leaps of discovery. There are evidence for an alien gift of advanced knowledge. Tech that appeared out of the blue and overnight. First, fiber optics. That replaces sending messages down wires by sending data in the form of light down a strand of glass. It is a clever and amazing idea. Immune from induction tapping, fast, multiplexing, and very secure. Even Land Rover, I love this story, replaced its vehicle CAM bus data lines with fiber optics on some vehicles, as it offers a robust corrosion-free data network. So does the iconic off-road vehicle actually use alien technology? Well, some models of Land Rovers certainly cost as much as a spaceship, so maybe they do. So here's my research, the history of fiber optics. This thing is Collardin's light fountain. Daniel Collardin and Jacques Babinet first demonstrated that guiding of light by refraction, the principle that makes fiber optics possible, in Paris in 1840. John Tyndall also included a fiber optic light pipe in his demonstrations in London and went on to write a book called Total Internal Reflection. So how do fiber optics basically work? Well, they work by internally reflecting a light beam that bounces off the edges of the fiber continuously in little Vs and so traveling down the pipe. Another early and non-alien development of fiber optics was in the 19th century when Viennese doctors used bent glass rods to illuminate dark cavities in the human body during surgery. Practical applications such as close internal illumination in dentistry followed, and then transmission through tubes was demonstrated independently by Clarence Hansel and very much experimented by the brilliant John Logie Baird in the 1920s. So here's my point. Old inventions are often forgotten and can be easily mistaken for the technology with no history. But the second often quoted alien technology did actually emerge in what I can only call a quantum leap, the transistor. The thermiotic triode, I actually know that as a vacuum tube, was invented in 1907. It was specifically used as an amplifier in long distance voice telecommunication. The glass tube or triode was a fragile device. And interestingly, hundreds were required. If you spoke on a long distance call, say from New York to San Francisco, every few, I don't know, 100 miles, your signal, your voice would be amplified and slightly distorted. So you can imagine a long distance phone call became a bit weird as it was distorted by these vacuum tubes. If only there was a loss free way of amplifying the voice. So a loss free amplification system was needed by the phone company. But its inventor was in Canada. Julius Egdo Lilyfield filed a patent for a solid state transistor in 1925, but he never developed it. But Shockley, there's a name to conjure with, at Bell Labs found the patent and attempted to build his own solid state transistor. 
but was unsuccessful. He was also hampered by the patent and needed to have a variation to actually produce a practical device that he could use and sell. So he invented something slightly different, which was brilliant. He looked at silicon as a semiconductor and realized it could pass electricity in one direction only, forming the basis of an amplifier. But of course, it wasn't just in the US. France was also doing this and had invented their own amplifier using a transistor. And where did they get the idea from? From a German radar effort in World War II. So transistors are man-made and they were developed by the phone company. But the quantum engineering to make it work did appear to come out of the blue. If for some reason you missed my interview with James Kakalios, he gave a fantastic, simple, everyday explanation of quantum physics. Here is my precy of what James said. Of course, go and listen to James. The link is in the description. The clue to what quantum physics is, in its name, the word quantum or number. To us, the world, the universe, appears analog. Everything can be infinitely variable. Any number can be set in any small increment. But at the subatomic level, energy jumps in quantum leaps, going from zero to 10, but never to eight and a half. These quantum steps are unique to the subatomic realm, busting the myth that atoms are miniature solar systems. I think of quantum physics like a CD player, boink, 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 and space a bit like an LP, but that's, I guess, just because I'm old. So although I'm not Adam Savage, or Adam Savage's dad, there's two myths busted. So what have we got left? What emerged overnight with the characteristics of the highly strange? Well, there is one technology that exactly fits the bill of crash-recovered alien ideas. And that is this thing, a cavity magnetron. A beautifully simple, organically shaped metal block with no moving parts. Nothing else is like it seemingly emerging overnight and to this day historians claim that the cavity magnetron won world war ii and the atomic weapon ended it so i've been on a research quest for you to find out where it came from well this is what books say the cavity magnetron was introduced by john randall and harry boot at the university of birmingham in 1940 the first working example produced hundreds of watts in the 10 centimeter wavelengths. But within weeks, engineers at GEC, and this is actually a big clue, had improved it to over a kilowatt and within months, 25 kilowatts of microwave power. The high power pulses are produced by a device no bigger than a book with no moving parts and transmitted from an antenna that only needs to be a centimetre long, the same as the wavelength, making it possible to miniaturise and put in aircraft. So this is my bit of fun. The cavity magnetron was really the cat's eyes of Cat's Eye Cunningham. It was the carrot that made you see in the dark. But most of all, it was the ace card of this man, the Tizard mission. His aim was to get the US to save Britain from Hitler's little games. That origin story is actually all a lie. Everything I did to find the true history of the cavity magnetron really drew a blank. It might as well have been a gift from a crashed flying saucer. Until my world changed, thanks to a man at his end of his life with a brilliant career. Sir Bernard Lovell. He says in this incredible clip from a long interview that during World War II, a German report into microwaves or centimeter frequency radar exposed the truth of where the cavity magnetron really came from. It wasn't just the two brilliant guys in a shed in Birmingham. It was actually a stolen Russian 
patent. So I received a John Bank, I think, three years ago. I'm talking about 2003 or four, from Wiebelinski, this report, which Hackenberg had written in February of 1943, in which, he gave, in which he had written a complete description of this equipment. And, you know, when he reached the story of the magnetron, I just, you know, I, I could hardly believe it. I'm afraid I nearly fell out of my chair. He said it may be interesting to note that the magnetron, the magnetron is a copy of a Russian patent. So I found this unbelievable. Well, I just complete that little bit of the story. I eventually got the original Russian papers on this um, um, on this astonishing story, and it's perfectly true. In Leningrad, in nineteen, I think in the early nineteen thirties, they had a complete magnetron working on the frame, same frequency that we were using, and giving the same sort of power. So armed with that statement you've just heard from Bernard Lovell, it opened the door for me to dig into Russian history and find out who in Russia designed the cavity magnetron. Oh, that story is very interesting. So here's a bit of Russian secret history. The first domestic research into the cavity magnetron was in Russia in the 1930s and involved Mr. D. Malyarov and Mr. Ann Alaskiev. There you go, my Russian is terrible. The further evolution of magnetron development occurred within the UK and the USA. Oh, that's interesting they say that. And in this report from the Russian University, they say the early development of the magnetron was lost during World War II. Yeah, kind of handy. But that leaves me with one of my classic big questions, and that is why didn't the Russians actually develop a centimeter cavity magnetron radar system? Oh, the answer is easy. Geography. The Soviets actually did build a very successful radar system to drive and steer their anti-aircraft guns to shoot down German aircraft once they were over Russia. That's the important part. Russia has a vast border, and they were more interested in shooting down the Germans once they'd crossed the border. They didn't have a need for an early warning system, unlike the UK. But Britain is an island nation, and it would be very useful to see those Germans crossing the enemy coast, giving the RAF at least three minutes to get in the air and shoot them down over the North Sea. And that's what happened. But to make a system that was over a hundred miles in range and accurate, they needed centimeter wave radar. So that's why Britain switched quickly from one meter frequency radar to microwave radar to get the range and also to miniaturize the system to be able to put it in aircraft and even bombs. But here's an observation that you've probably not heard before, that UK radar didn't actually work over the English Channel, quite simply because the English Channel is too small or short a crossing. So all the dogfights of the Battle of Britain took place in Sussex and Kent, where the RAF bravely fought the German aircraft before they reached London, because radar didn't give them enough range, hence these iconic pictures of dogfights over Kent. Excuse my demeanour of being actually in agony as I'm reading this to you. Um, my big advice is don't wear Crocs if you've got goats. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Go and listen to James Gacalios' interview. Very few people actually watched it, and it actually includes some golden nuggets of why physicists interface with UAP and UFO technology, and James's fantastic description of quantum mechanics.